himself as a Shekinah glory of God. All right? And every little detail in the tabernacle teaches something to us. Every detail teaches something. And we can look at it a little bit today. But in glory, we're going to learn a whole lot more about it. Because we will be able to see like we've never seen before. But we'll look at it now. Now, we talked about the framework of the tabernacle in Exodus 26, 15-30. And the, the boards that were all stood upright around the edge of the tabernacle. And the boards were made out of what? Wood. All right. Acacia wood, by the way. And acacia wood has a lot of pitch or preservative in it, doesn't it? All right? And that typifies Christ that he would have never died because he was perfect humanity. All right? God became flesh, and he became flesh without an outside of sin. All right? Now, the boards were covered with what? Gold. Gold. Gold typifies what in the Bible? Divinity. It's divine. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the metal that represents divinity. God himself. Well, just look at this now for just a minute. This is something that the religious world does not understand today, and they've been arguing about it for hundreds of years, especially the cults. And what do we mean by cult? C-U-L-T. Cult. What is a cult? Pseudo-Christian. It's a... Well, yes, pseudo-Christian. And what does pseudo-Christian mean? False Christians. Now, what can you name some pseudo-Christian cults? Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness. Mormons. Mormons. Unity. Unitarianism. All, all these, and there's many, many different groups of this. Uh, Christadelphians. These are all what we call pseudo-Christians. And they get this all messed up. Well, the Bible from Genesis all the way through Revelation has said one thing about Jesus Christ. I want you to understand that right now. That He is God. And that He is man too. <coughs> and in the Old Testament Scriptures, in those Old Testament scriptures. It foretold how God would become mankind. He would live, God would come down into the human race through a woman. Now when was that promise made? When was that first promise made like that? Genesis. Is it the, Genesis? First, uh, when they, the third chapter. Third chapter. Somebody turn there with, for me. Genesis 3. And we're going to see this because this is extremely important to them. You've got people coming to your doors almost every week unless you live in some fenced community. <laughs> or guard dogs all around your house or something. Genesis 3. Brother uh, Fernando, do you have that? Genesis 3. 3.15 I think it is. 15 through 17, something like that. Where is it? <laughs> All right, God's speaking, and He's speaking to the devil, and He's speaking to the human race here also. All right? And I will put enmity in, in, in between you and the woman. All right? And between your seed and her seed, He shall bruise you on, your, on, on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Yeah. All right. I will put active hatred between you. Who is that? Who's he speaking to? The devil. All right. Between you and her seed. Who is her seed? Jesus. Jesus Christ and his seed. Who is that? The Antichrist to come. Do you know? That on this earth, one day, there is going to be a devil man. Just think about that for a while. We have had the God man. But one of these days, there will be a devil man. And in, in a way, all the way down through history, all the way through history, Satan has had his men in the world. He has. He's had his men in the world. But this is going to be in a special way. 
the devil is going to be incarnate in this man. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation that the world will fall down, the lost world, will fall down and worship him. And Satan will receive his glory during that tribulation period in this world. What a horrible thing. Well, he was talking to the woman there, and he said her seed. Now, if you look in the Bible and you look at most history, you'll find out that the lineage does not go through the woman, does it? Abraham's lineage went through the firstborn sons that it all the way down to the line all the way through Israel, all the way into the time of Jesus, and even Jesus in his time, the firstborn son was the heir of the family. Okay? The firstborn son was the heir of, fam of the family, and he was the father's son. Okay? But this son that would be born into the world was not of a man. Was he? He was the son of a woman. Mary. Is talking about. That's talking about Mary. Now Eve thought, as Adam's wife, Eve thought that when her firstborn child was born, that he would be who? The heir. The Messiah. That was to come. That would save all the human race. Yep. <laughs> she thought that he was the Messiah. And what was his name? What was her firstborn son's name? Cain. What does Cain mean in Hebrew? What? What does it mean in Hebrew? What does, it, what does Cain mean in Hebrew? I, no, it's not I forgot, brother. That's <laughs> 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 not it. Yes. What's Cain mean? Come on. Brother Ken. No. Who remembers that? No. Well, received or gotten. Gotten. The gotten one. And she made a declaration there in the book of Genesis said, when he was born, we have gotten a man, even the Lord. That's what she said. We have gotten Jehovah. He has become flesh now. It came. She thought that this was going to be the Messiah. But what kind of a, uh, a revelation did she receive later? He wasn't the Messiah. He was a bad man. All right. He killed his brother. And I want, to un want you to understand one thing. All this is leading up to the tabernacle. Who were the two combatants there? One was aggressive and one was passive. But they were... <coughs> All right. No, not in, in this time. Cain and who? Cain and Abel. I want you to understand this one thing. And so many times I haven't heard this brought out in any pulpit. Abel was never any threat at all to Cain, period. He was not the heir. Now, that was, Abel was never a threat to Cain at all. Cain was the firstborn son, and Cain was the heir indelibly. He was the heir. Well, Isha, uh, Eve, <laughs> I couldn't think of it in English. <laughs> Eve, she thought this was the Messiah. But the next son, now many times in Scripture, there is also another type and another law set down in Scripture. And it, and it is the rejection of the firstborn. The rejection of the firstborn. Okay? Rejection of the firstborn. So the first son that was born was what? He was accursed. You know that in the Old Testament law, every firstborn that was born of all animals and everything else had to be redeemed because it was a curse. Because it was God's. Okay? It had to be redeemed with another animal. Something had to die. A sacrifice had to be paid for that firstborn. And the first time you're born into this world, when you're born of a man and a woman, you're cursed. You know that? You are cursed. Because you're born in sin. You're born under the law of sin, under the Adamic nature, and you are going to die. You're born to die. All right? When you're born again, when that redemption is paid, guess what? You're born of earth the first time, and then you're born of heaven or born from above. All right? 
Well, we see that in the Old Testament times. Abel was never, never any threat to Cain whatsoever. But Abel did the things that God wanted him to do, and the firstborn son went his own way and did his own thing. He did not want to offer an animal sacrifice. He offered the fruit of the fields. And the fruit of the fields could not... There wasn't something innocent dying for the guilty. The animal sacrifice, an innocent animal died for the guilty. All right? And that's what that portrayed, and that was a type, just like this tabernacle's type. Now let's go back and look. Now we have the wood in the tabernacle, in the boards that surround the tabernacle. There are wood which typifies humanity, and there are gold which typifies divinity. So Christ was God and he was man. Don't ever... God said he, he is the seed of the woman. This is the one that was promised to Eve in the garden. Alright? He is the one. And I've said this many times before and I'll say it again because there's some new ones in the class. A woman does not pass on the sin nature to a child. Not one bit of a woman's blood ever flows in your child's veins. Did you know that? It's the man. It is the man where the blood comes from. And it is the man that gives the sin nature to children. So when Jesus was born, he was not born of a man. He was born of God. And he was born of a woman. And there was no sin nature that flowed in his veins whatsoever, period. That's a beautiful teaching. And you and that's in scripture. Alright, let's go on a little bit further now. We we're gonna go on down to number six. See that where it says coverings? Alright? The word coverings in Hebrew, by the way, what is the Hebrew word for coverings? Does anybody know? Kafar. Kafar, thank you, brother. Kafar. Alright? Kafar <laughs> is the word. And the and the you know, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, all right, Yom Kippur. That comes from that word covering there, the Day of Atonement, the day that their sins are covered, all right? Now, these coverings on this tabernacle, get up here. Here is the tabernacle. I'm drawing it crooked again, as you can see. It's not even in the middle of there. But as you go in here, and this tent in here that has boards all around it has coverings over it. All right, it had coverings over it, and they were too big for it, so they so they <coughs> went down over the ends of it. Okay. Now these are the coverings we're talking about. Okay, the general directions. There are four in number. The first cut curtain is a fine fine linen. All right. This fine, fine linen. Now, this fine linen, linen is naturally what color? White. White, which stands for what? Purity. The righteousness and the purity of the God-man. All right? That was in flesh, but without the sin nature. Beautiful. And I've told you this before also. Even though Jesus lived a perfect life, if he had lived a perfect life and just gone to heaven after he lived the life, what would he, what, what would he have done to the human race? Just further condemned it. He had to die. He had to die and be the sin offering for the human race. Not only did he have to die, but there was something else that was extremely necessary that you see the cults going all wrong on. He has to arise. He had to be He had to rise from the grave. Death was not enough. He had to be resurrected. The first curtain was a fine, fine linen. Scarlet, purple, blue. And then it had cherubims embroidered on it. All right? It was white. It had scarlet on it. What do you think the scarlets stood for? Blood of a sacrifice. Okay? Purple. What kind of a garment did they put on Jesus as they were humiliating him before the human race there in Jerusalem? A purple garment, and, and they mocked him. He was really the king of glory. He was the king of glory. He was the promised Messiah. He was God in flesh that 
God promised Mary in Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15. And blue. Blue. I know we don't know much about that in Bakersfield. <laughs> but every now and then there's a blue sky in Bakersfield. And blue is the place where heaven is, isn't it? And he was the God that came from heaven and visited man. John 1. 14. John 1, 14. Somebody turn and read that for me again. You have to just get this intelligently in your mind because this is so indicative of what the tabernacle teaches. John 1, 14. Who's got that, Jesse? And, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from His Father, full of grace and truth. All right. It says really in the original language, Kaho Logos, Sarkagento. And the word, the Logos, the word. And what does that word mean? How should it really be translated? God. The Jehovah. Flesh, he became. Do you understand that? Now, this tabernacle teaches all of this. The uh, how many of you know what Muslim is? How many of you ever got a chance to witness the Muslim? Well, if you want to witness the Muslims, the tabernacle is a good way to do it. It is a good way to witness to Jehovah's Witnesses. It is a good way to witness to Mormons. Because what is taught in the tabernacle, these are real true types. And when we began this class on types in this part of doctrines of the Bible, we showed how important and how God had indelibly put down types in the Bible that were divinely appointed types that portrayed prophecy that something was going to happen, okay? So this is a real good way to witness to Jehovah's Witnesses, to Mormons or anything. Just take out what you have learned on the tabernacle, all of your notes that you have, and start teaching them what the Old Testament Scripture said about God, the person of God, okay? And how that He would redeem mankind. Now, we have the scarlet, we have the purple, we have the blue, and then we have cherubims embroidered on this white also. Why do you think the cherubims are there? To witness. Witnesses. The Old Testament said without two or three witnesses, or with, with two or three witnesses, let everything be established. Or without the witnesses, nothing is established. There are witnesses. And when you're, born, when you're born again into this world, there's witnesses, there's angels there in the presence being witnesses. That's what the, the over the, the Holy of Holies in here, the two cherubims over the Ark of the Covenant, they stood for the two witnesses. And again, we have that same teaching taught also. And when is the next time the angels come? The angels witness. When you die, angels come. Angels come for you. The next time. Two times in your life as a child of God that you're going to meet angels. Whether you know they're there or not. One when you're born again and the other when you leave this world. When you're ushered into glory. Alright. We're down. We're studying the tabernacle. We're studying about the coverings over the tabernacle. All right, now we have the first one. It is linen, and it has these colors and these beautiful pictures embroidered into it. Next one is goat's hair. How many of you saw the class I taught on the Dead Sea Scrolls? Here. All right, some of you. I put a picture up there on, on this when I was... I showed you a lot of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the caves over there, the Qumran caves and the... And the, uh, and the the shrine uh, of the scroll in Jerusalem. And as I was running out over the country, I took up. Yes, brother. What is that? The Dead Sea Scrolls? Oh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are the writings that the Essenes or the Qumranians did that go all the way back to as far as 300 B.C. And they were in existence until uh, Caesar came when they were going to go destroy Jerusalem. One of the first things they destroyed was the Dead 
well, with the Qumranians or the Essenes there that were at the Dead Sea, and they were the ones that copied the scriptures, and that's the oldest scriptures that we have in the world, basically came from those people. That's when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, when I was out there, we got some, we had some seats right up here in front. You ought to we got a lot of. <laughs> when I was going out over the countryside, going up to Jerusalem, there. Uh, people live over there like they did four or five thousand years ago still. What they call the Bedouins. All right? These are a nomadic people. By the way, these people are living like God told man to live. Okay? Nomadic folks don't, don't, don't build cities and all that and live out there. And in and, and, and one way in their life, they are living like they're supposed to. They're living out off of the land. They've got sheep herds and goat herds out there. And you can see them from far away off because they've got these great big tents. And these tents are woven out of goat's hair. And guess what color they are? What color they were they in that picture that I showed you? They were a big green background, and these tents were black. All right? The tents were black, made out of goat hair. All, I mean, they say some of the, the, the tents there are two and three and four and five hundred, six hundred, a thousand years old. When I was in the Middle East, I walked on carpets that were over three thousand years old. Weird. Some of those lost. Carpets that are three and four thousand years old. Well, look, some of those old tents are black tents. Now these, this goat hair, this black that goes over this tabernacle, what do you think that black stands for? Sin. 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 What happened on the cross of Calvary to Jesus? Your sin was placed upon him. I don't care if you're lost in this room today. Your sin was on him. When Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, every man's sin on, that ever lived or ever would live was on him. If you don't pick up that gift and, and redemption that he made for you there, it's your fault. All right? It's your fault. Because he died for you. Every man's sin that would ever live from all the way from Adam to the last man that had ever been born in the millennial reign on this earth, Jesus Christ died for their sins. And their sins were placed upon him there. Isn't this a beautiful teaching in God's Word that so many times we just look over? Okay? Third, ram skin. What color is ram skin normally? White. White. All right? If you want to see something beautiful white, uh, wash a, a lamb. Go out there to fair and see how beautiful white when they wash those lambs up and get them all ready for a show and everything out there, they, they block them and, and they wash them, just shine them up. And they're white, beautiful white. Well, that's what this was. Now, what do you think it was a ram skin? What is a ram? What is a ram? A male sheep. Okay, a male sheep. Why do you think it's got to be a male sheep? Sin came through the man. Well, sin came through the man. But who is this sheep representing? Christ. Christ. Jesus, which was male. By the way, God is male. Okay? Let's just settle that right now. All of these politically correct Bibles and everything else, the Bible says that God is masculine. I don't know why God calls himself masculine, but I accept that. Theos is the Greek word for it, okay? Theos. Just like that. And the end, and the Greek language is inflected. What does that say right there? You remember Brother Ken, what is that? Nominous, singular, Nominous, masculine. And singular, and masculine in gender. <coughs> Greek is perfection. Jim? It tells you what place it plays in the sentence, and what number it is, and what gender it is. Yes? How would it, how would it say if it was... Feminine or not? Well, there there isn't. You can't. Spell. You can't say. Well, it would be like this, like that. All right, a goddess or something. Like
like that, okay? But, but it's not true. But this is nominative singular masculine. This is masculine. God has always spoken of masculine. Even the Old Testament. It is He. He. Him. When we talk about Jesus in the Old Testament in the Psalms, it calls Him the Father of Eternity. The Father of Eternity. They call Him the Mother of Eternity. They call Him the Father of Eternity. All right? The Father of the Ages. Another translation of it. All right, now here we have this ram's skin. This boy sheep's skin. Okay? This boy sheep. Now this skin is normally white. But what did they do to this skin? They dyed it red, the color of blood. The color of blood. Well, this movie that's coming out, The Passion of Christ, is supposed to be very graphic. The Jewish people have absolutely had a wall-eyed fit about it. Because I think it leaves the blame exactly where they asked for it to be left back then. What did the Jews say when they had when they had Jesus crucified? Let his blood be on ours. Five times, five times, Pilate pronounced him innocent. He even beat him half to, mostly to death. He wasn't going to do that. He didn't have to do that, but he did. And he felt, well, maybe they'll have mercy on him when they see this man's blood on the ground. Maybe they'll have... You know, when you see somebody hurt real bad, sometimes you have mercy on them. Well, they had his feet brought out before him again, and then they said, kill him, kill him. Kill him, kill him. I remember a preacher, R.G. Lee, when he was talking about, about his daughter one time. He said, I used to slip up on my daughter and say, boo. He said, I went up in her bedroom one time, and she was sitting there reading her Bible. And she was right there in, in the Gospel of John where they were going to crucify Jesus. And he walks up to her and her tears are going down her face and she's just shaking all over. And, and he, he starts to say boo to her and he sees that she's terrible. And he looked at her and he says, Sweetheart, what's wrong? He said, They're going to kill him! They're going to kill him! And he hasn't done anything. They're going to kill him. Well, see, that's what this Bible teaches here in the Old Testament what's going to happen to Jesus. His blood was shed. His blood was shed. Lord. Yeah, you know, it would be interesting to know what was going through the high priest's mind after they crucified Jesus and then their, their veil was rent, exposing the Holy of Holies. You can find just a little bit about in the Arco volume. It must have been a horrible <laughs> thought. You can find a little bit, brother. Brother Jim, wasn't there an earthquake? Did it split the temple too? There was an earthquake also. Uh, and it, it didn't demolish the temple? It didn't demolish it, no. Uh, and there was a lot of stories about that also. Yeah. We can't go into that right now. But, In the movie. but there was a great earthquake. There was an earthquake. The sky was black. It shook. It scared people. People died of fright. People dropped dead when that happened. <coughs> when all of this took place, people were falling over dead, especially old people. Some young people, they felt it. They talked about them all. And history says that people died as far away as Egypt. <laughs> Dropped dead because they were scared to death. They thought the world was coming to an end. Well, the Creator tasted death on the cross of Calvary for you and for me. He tasted death. This, this, this ram skin died red. That typified that Christ would shed his blood for our sins. Number four, the fourth thing. By the way, look at it. How many? Four Gospels? Four, four directions? Four natures? Number four. The number four, the number four, the number four. Over and over and over again as you see this. The numbers mean something also. Number four. Now here we have a translation. It could mean seal or dolphin skin. A seal, seal skin. And it calls badger skin, King James, I think it is. But what color is seal skin? Gray. gray. It's a grayish, brownish. You can see them all the way from gold to brown to gray. Okay? What do you think that represents? The brown color. 
that God came to earth. Also, in mythology and in the ancient world, what do you think the dolphins and the sin, the seals stood for also? How many of you know that? How many of you read enough in, in Greek mythology and stuff to realize what the dolphin and what the seal, what does it stand for? Nobody. Brother Ken, what have they been teaching you out there at Cal State? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> what does a dolphin do out in the ocean? How many of you have been out in the ocean? How many of you watch the flipper? <laughs> All right. What does a, what does a dolphin do? Swim. He goes down in the water and comes back up out of the water and down in the water and up out of the water. Now what do you think it typifies? The resurrection. The resurrection. This animal typified the rapture. A dolphin or a seal, either one, typified because they dive and they come back up. They gotta breathe. Because they, they breathe air. Yeah. <laughs> they're mammals. All right, they're mammals. So they can die, but they come back up. And when they saw this thing in the ancient world and even in the, in the Egyptians, they looked at the dolphins and the seals as a type of the resurrection, how man goes down in the earth, but he, he rises again in glory. So we see that in this. B, the curtain of linen. Exodus 26, 1 through 6. Look at, look at that. It's made up of ten cubits sewed in the two breadths of five each. Look at all these numbers. Twenty-eight cubits, forty-two feet by fifteen feet, by the way. Two curtains were linked with on one hundred loops of blue and fifty hooks of gold. Someone turn there, Exodus for me. Twenty-six, one through six. We're going to read about that just a little bit. Okay, Jesse. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains and five with the linen. In blue and purple and scarlet material, you shall make them with cherubim, cherubim, cherubim. angels, the work of a skillful workman. All right, now this skillful workman there—that means an inspired worker. These these workers were inspired by God to do this, because this was very important. How important was it? This is a type of God that is going to come to the world. All right. That's what it is. Go ahead, Brother Jesse. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits, and the width of each curtain 4 cubits. All the curtains shall have the same measurement. Five curtains shall be joined to one another, and the other five curtains shall be joined to one another. What's the number of grace in the Bible? Five. Five. Look at that. By grace, we are saved. Go ahead, Brother. We shall make loops of blue on the edge of the outermost curtain in the first set, and likewise you shall make them on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in the second set. You shall make fifty loops in the one curtain, and you shall make fifty loops on the edge of the curtain that is in the second set. The loops shall be opposite each other. You shall make fifty claps of gold and join the curtains to one another with the clamps so that the tabernacle will be a unit. All right, it's a unit, isn't it? I want you to understand one thing. There aren't three gods. We believe in a triune, we believe in a trinity, but there aren't three gods out there. There's one God. That's also what that means, that there is one God. He has manifested to, to you humankind in three ways, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know that even the Lakota Indians, the, the Sioux Indians, what we call Sioux Indians, Sioux, you know, we don't like to be called Sioux. I'm Sioux. Indian, all right. <laughs> we don't like to be called Sioux because that means cutthroat. <laughs> That's what it means. It's a French Ojibwe term which means cutthroat. But we look at ourselves as Lakota, Nakota, or Dakota. All right? Dakota. What does Dakota mean? One of the human beings. That's what it means. One of the human beings. One of the human beings. One of the human race. Humans. We call ourselves humans, all right, because God made us. And in that in that language, there are three terms for God. All right, three terms for God. Wakan Tonka. That means the Father. The Son is Tonka Shiva. That's the Son. And then the Holy Spirit is called Skon Taku Skon Skon. And that means 
that God, that part with God, which makes everything live. That's what makes the trees put leaves on in the spring. And by the way, the spring to them typifies the resurrection. All right? That's another thing. Let's look on here a little bit further now. Did you finish there, Brother uh, Jesse? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Number two, typical significance. Lenin, of course, means what? The pure righteousness of God. <clears throat> and it's one of the finest, finest pieces of material that was ever woven from flax in the ancient world. And some of your finest... When women like to go to uh, fine restaurants, what kind of napkins do they want to see on the table? Linen napkins. All right, these fine cloth napkins. All right. I don't like women want to do that. Just, to me, it could just be a piece of paper. <laughs> But women like to see this because it's fine. That typifies luxury. All right? Christ is the finest, most perfect human that ever walked on the face of God's earth. All right? That, that linen typifies Christ. All right? Now, in the veil... Some of the same colors that are in the veil were in this first covering on the tabernacle. That was the one that was on the inside, all right? Now, every color in the veil, where did they get the colors to dye this material? He had to get it from plants, didn't they? Well, they got it from animals. Remember Lydia, the dyer of purple? Purple is, is, is that color. All right, many of the blues, many of the reds. And, and the red, by the way, came from a worm. It was from a worm. It was a, it was a dye that was extracted from a worm. But guess what you had to do to the worm to get the dye? Kill it. Now, Lydia, Lydia, she was a seller of purple. Where did she get the purple? From shellfish. Well, you, from the shellfish, what had to happen to the shellfish before you got the color? It had to die. Do you see how that everything in this tabernacle, something had to die? Something innocent had to die for something guilty? By the way, they didn't do anything. Every color in here came from the death of some type of animal life. And by the way, in, L in Lakota history, in Lakota theology, God that, that puts life in everything that lives and moves, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God that is in a tree, that's in every animal. They believe when that tree or that animal is cut down, that spirit goes back to God. Because it's called the Holy Spirit. And He makes new ones. I uh, really fought hard when I lived in Nevada. I lived up there for about 15 years. And I walked all over those mountains and everything, and, and they did a big article on me one time in the, in the newspaper up there. They had something on the front page of it. And I don't want to know if you ever seen the thing or not. But they did an article on me, and, and, and I was working as a missionary among Indians. One of the things that I did, I tried to protect things. And one of the things that I tried to protect were the, the petroglyph sites. How many of you heard of a petroglyph? That's where people uh, in the ancient times went and pecked little designs on rocks and stuff. And I told them what those designs were. Most Indians won't say one word about our culture. But I opened up and I told what those signs were. I said, those signs are prayers that God, Skonkaku, Skon's God, would the Spirit of God when they took an animal from this world that God would give another one and replace it so they would continuously have feet and so they would draw ducks on there and they would draw sheep and they would draw antelope and all these little animals and what they were doing is asking God to replenish the earth as they would take and as they would harvest and reap from the earth that God would replenish them and I tried to protect those sites because people were going up there and shooting them up hauling them off tearing them up and everything else 
God, the Spirit of God is in all life. That's what you know, your trees, except for your evergreens, go to sleep in the wintertime, don't they? And they wake up in the summer. You know what makes them wake up? It's the power of God. You know why the sun keeps revolving around the earth and the earth keeps turning? You know why that happens? It is the power of God. In Greek, it's called dynamis. Dynamis. Our word dynamite comes from that word dynamis. All right? Dynamis. Power. Strength. And, of course, the book of Colossians is such a beautiful book. We're, going, we're studying First and Second Thessalonians in this class on Wednesday night from Greek, by the way. One of the next books that we're going to study after First and Second Thessalonians is the book of Colossians because it talks about God. That's theology. It tells who God is. And it tells that Jesus is in everything that he created. His power brought everything into existence. And you know what keeps it going? Jesus. He keeps everything going the right way. Well, a curtain of goat's hair. Exodus 26, 7 through 13. Exodus, the 26th chapter, 7 through 13. Let's look at the goat's hair. All right. Who's got that one? Exodus 26, 7 through 13. We state this, but let's look at it in the Bible. We thought, Mary. Make heavy sheets of cloth from goat hair to cover the tabernacle. There must be eleven of these sheets, each forty-five feet long and six feet wide. All eleven of these sheets must be exactly the same size. Join five of these together into one set, and join the other six into a second set. The sixth sheet of the second set is to be doubled over at the entrance of the sacred tent. Put fifty loops along the edge of the last sheet in each set and fasten them together with 50 bronze clasps. In this way, the two sets will become a single unit. An extra half sheet of this roof covering will be left to hang over the back of the temp tabernacle, and the covering will hang down an extra 18 inches on each side. And that was the end of my 13. All right. Six on one end, five on the other. What do you think that represents? Six and five. This go text. All right, six. Is what? What number is? What is six? Man's number. When? What day was man created on? Six. The sixth six day. In the book of Revelation, there is a number there. Everybody all here have heard that one time or another. <laughs> six, six, six. Man, man, man. Real Adamic man. That one is going to be devil man. All right. Hmm. Six is the number of man. Was, was, did God become man? Five. The number of what? Grace. 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 God became man and by grace, unmerited favor, man was lined up, brought back to God. In this. All right. Let's go on a little bit further. The curtains of ram skin dyed red. Exodus 26 and verse 14. We just got a verse there. Brother Ken, you got that one? No. Who's got that one? Brother John. And you shall also make a covering of ram skin dyed red for the tent and a covering of badger skins above that. All right. Now, the here we have, when you come to the tabernacle, what's the first covering that's on there? You're not going to see this one. You only know that it's there. Okay. What color is it? It's righteous, and it's white, and it's got red in it, and it's got blue, and it's got purple, and it's got cherubims embroidered into it. That one's all covered up here. It's underneath the other coverings. Then we have, what's the next color? Huh? Red. Red. The blood of Christ. The whole world, when Jesus came into this world and he died and he shed his blood, half the world doesn't care about it. You know that? Because the true mercies and the true beauty of God's grace, how it came down to earth, is hidden by humanity, by ungodliness and worldliness. You can't see it, of course, because of your ungodly outlooks on the world. Okay? 
So that's covered up too. Now the next color, all right, that we have here is what? The goat's hair. The goat's hair. That one was black. That was the sin that was laid upon Christ. And then E down here, the last one is the seal skin or the badger skin or the dolphin skin, whatever you want to call it. All right, Exodus 26, verse 14. Exodus 26, verse 14. You got that there, Brother John? Yes, uh, Exodus 26, 14. Yes. You shall also make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent and a covering of badger skins above that. All right, so, so we have the red. Now we have the dolphin skins or seal skins above that. And what color is that? Just brown looking color, man. Just a brown looking color. When you saw Jesus when he walked on this earth, if you just glanced at him, what would you see? What would you see? A what? Normal Joe. A man. Just a man. Just walk by and you'd see a man. That's what you'd see. Anybody would, they would come a normal Joe. <laughs> When you'd walk by and you'd see this man, if you didn't listen to him, if you didn't hear his words, if you didn't see his actions at all, he just looked like a man, didn't he? From the rest of the world out here, this little old tent that was covered with this last covering, what did they see? Just another tent. That's all. Just another tent. That's all. Just another tent out there in the desert because they were planning it. Didn't look any different. How many of you, when you came to church, it was just like coming to any other church? You just heard some preaching and you got bored and you sat there and twiddled your thumbs or whatever else, you know, and listened to some of the word and, and, it, and the rest of it went out in one ear and out the other ear. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit of God, this God, talking to God, God, this one that works, makes things alive. The Holy Spirit starts working on your heart. And you begin to understand something. You begin to understand that you're separated from God. That you aren't, you just can't walk into the presence of God the way you are. That you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. I'm undone. I can't look at God and go, God don't like me either. You know that God doesn't like you when you're a sinner? God hates you. But everybody says God loves you. No, God hates you. God hates sinners. Did you know that? He hates them. He hates sin. He can't look upon you. He can't. Because He's righteous and you're sinful. God's got to change you before He loves you. I've heard people say, well, God wouldn't send anybody. If God loves, so loved the world, why would He send anybody to hell? He don't love them. He hates them. If you aren't covered with the blood of Christ, God doesn't want to look at you. You're no good. Without Christ, without the blood of Christ applied to your life, God hates you. And He's going to send you to hell. That's what He's going to do. That's simple theological facts. A lot of people don't like to think about that. A lot of religions say, well, God loves everybody. When Jesus died, He covered everybody's sins. You don't have to do anything. He already covered you. No. You have to come to your life. And there's a point in your life where you have to come to God and say, God. And you do this by hearing the Word of God or reading the Word of God. I remember when I was saved. What started me wanting to seek God was I was raised by my grandmother. And my grandmother got killed. And I was alone in this world. And I'd been going to this little old church. And I went in there and I talked about feeling alone. I was about 13 years old and I was out in the world alone. So she took care of me. And my mother was gone. And my mother, I really didn't really know. My own mother because I never was around her much. My grandmother just took me and raised me. 
And I just felt like I was just lost in the world. And I went to church and I heard the preaching of God's Word. Not much of it, by the way. It wasn't a very true church. But I heard the preaching of God's Word and the Holy Spirit did His job. If a frog could croak the gospel, God's Holy Spirit would honor it. God says, My word will not return unto me void. And you know what? I was really unhappy. And I started reading the Bible. And I went to church several nights. I mean, I was going to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, or Thursday night, or whatever night they went to church on. I don't even remember now. It was too long ago. 1961. That was before most of you were born. <laughs> I went to church, and I this this preacher gave me this Bible. Well, when you get a book, where do you start reading? In the front of it. I started reading in the front of the book, and all I got in that book was that I was condemned over and over and over again. I finally got over to the New Testament and started reading about Jesus. And I heard more about Him from the book than I did from the pulpit, I guarantee you that much. The Word of God got me from the book. It wasn't even a good translation. <laughs> it got me. And I was sad. Because all I could see, there wasn't any mercy or anything. I was a sinner. I had done the things that, that they said not to do. That you were supposed to be killed. I thought, well, maybe I could sacrifice my dog. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or whatever, you know. I didn't know what was going on here. I, you had something had to die for the guilty person, you know. <laughs> <laughs> a bird whatever you know I mean I saw all these things that were offered for offerings in there I'm not kidding I figured out which one of them I was going to kill you know, and build me an altar up out there because I didn't see anything else then I got into the New Testament well you go Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and when you read those you just talk about Jesus dying well, in the New Testament, really where you start understanding about the gospel is over there in, in the book of Acts onward where we have the preaching of the apostles. Well, I got over there and I found out there's another way than killing my dog. My cat got to live. I mean, I didn't have to kill the cat or the neighbor's bird or whatever, you know. I didn't have to go out there and build an altar because the altar had already been built way back here in the Old Testament time. But it typified something that was going to happen in the New Testament times. The next church service, when they said, you can come down here and be saved, I ran down there. Scared to death. You know what? I wouldn't even talk to anybody back then. Nobody here knows me when I was young. But I was so quiet, I wouldn't say a word. My teachers would write notes to my mother. How do you get this, this boy talk at home? Does he ever say? Does he ever open his mouth? I get up there and try to get me in front of the classroom to say something. I just stand up there and put my head down. Wouldn't do anything. That's what you call the power of God when I get up there and preach like this. See, that God changed me. <laughs> I wouldn't say a word. Not a word. My grandmother would go to go and take me to. I call her mama. She'd take me to to, to school. And, and put me in there and they say, we can't get him to say anything. He won't even tell us when he's sick. Well, God fixes it. He changes things. Well, I went up there in that little church. I got up there and my step-grandmother was there. And she walked up there when she saw I went down there and she said, Jimmy, what are you doing? And I said, I, 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 I'm, I'm lost and I want to be saved. So she prayed with me. And you know what she told me to do? She said, well, Jimmy, you've got to tell God that you're a sinner. And I did. I said, you know, Jesus, you already know I'm a sinner. I, you know, I've done all these things and everything else, and I'm young and everything else, and I'm alone in this world, and I want to be saved, and I at least want to know that my soul is saved. Well, I said, and she said, now you have to ask him to forgive you for Jesus' sake. All right, I do that. So, Lord, forgive me. And you know what? I walked out there a different person that day. My life wasn't totally changed that day. But God was in me that day. 
God was in my heart. And from that point of time on in my life, He never left me. I didn't serve God because I didn't even know how. I had no good examples in my life of how to serve God. But out of 300 people in my immediate family, about 285 of them were alcoholics. My stepfather that had raised me was in and out of prison all his life. He was one of that real famous guy that broke out of that Michigan prison in that helicopter. I buried him two or three years, four, four years ago now, I guess five years ago. He was Dale Otto Remlin, that real famous criminal. Con artist and everything else, terrible man. But that's who I, that's the only thing I knew. With all these criminals and thugs around me. You know what? You can be raised among gangs and criminals and thugs and everything like that, and God can save you right out of the middle of it. He can do it. And what we're studying today in this Old Testament teaches that. Six and five. You're six, aren't you? You're man. If it wasn't for God, you'd be six, six, six. I'm telling you. You'd be Satan's man if it wasn't for God. But every person in the human race, every person Jesus died for. And that's what this tabernacle is talking about. We come back next week and we're going to study more about it. We're going to study about the altar next week. This, this weird altar that's partially made out of wood. God died for you. God tasted death for every man, every woman, every person. I want to tell you something, some assurance. Every little baby that's ever been aborted in this world is gone to heaven. You know that? Every little baby in the Muslim world before they grew up and they died before they came to the age of accountability is going to be with God. That's mercy, I'll tell you. Every little ch children, every little child in Bosnia or Africa or wherever, all these little babies that are dying at, at, at birth and when they're six months old or a year old, guess what? God's populating heaven with them. Because the blood of Jesus Christ covers everybody that hasn't come to the age of accountability. But once that you know that you're a sinner and once you get up sometimes five, six, seven years old, ten, eleven, twelve, it was thirteen for me, Once you come to know that you're a sinner, have you ever felt like you're being watched? Huh? Well, you are. <laughs> God, why? You don't get a buy with anything. God knows everything you do in the secrets of your mind and everything. Once you come to the age of accountability, then you're lost. Then you need a Savior. Then you need to look to the tabernacle. You need to look what God has done for you and how He has prepared a sacrifice for you. And you don't have to kill your dog, your cat, your neighbor's bird, or anything else and offer a sacrifice because Jesus already did it. He is that sacrifice. He is the one. Now, I pray if you're here today and, you're, and you don't know the Lord, that you'll pray with me and you'll ask God in your life. He can't say. And I'm going to turn over to Brother Kent in just a minute. Father, we pray this morning as I finish this message that, that wherever you hear this message, that it will touch people's hearts. And in this classroom today, if there's one here that does not know you, that they won't walk out of here in eternity lost. That they will say, Lord, forgive me and save my soul and forgive me of my sins. But this Jesus paid the cost and I know it today. Well, Ken, it's yours. All right, I'll go through <clears throat> what we have here on the thing, and if you have anything else, go ahead and let me know. And I'll... All right, we want to pray for protection and guidance for Amy Treviso. Pray for my brother, my is it brother. Stacy Adams to come home from Kuwait soon. Uh, praise. Uh, strike is over at the UFCW total vote count today.
so that's over. Um, salvation for, I guess, is a pray, uh, uh, pray for. Um, salvation for my in-laws, Jan and Orland, and help help my dad to be okay. Please continue to play for Art um, Therese. 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 All right. For God to give him strength, wisdom, as he studies for the task to become a foreman at his job. Praise for the Lord's care 